Hi everyone, I'm David. I'm super excited to be here to talk to you about how you can derive more meaningful business insights using Amazon Redshift. Beside me is Ahmed. Uh, before that, I'm also a solutions architect. I uh, help out in the AWS analytics domain. Beside me is Ahmed, I'll let Ahmed introduce himself. Hi everyone, my name is Ahmed Shahata. I'm a senior data warehousing specialist. I'm specialized in analytics, specifically Amazon Redshift. And today I'll be co-hosting this event with David. Back to you, David. Thanks. So before we get started, I just want to share a case, a, a, a fact about data growth. So more data is created per hour now than in an entire year just two decades ago. So you can see this data growth in two ways, an opportunity as well as a challenge. The opportunity is that you can derive more business, more meaningful business insights to deliver better services for Canadian citizens. The challenge is, is that you have to really understand how the infrastructure works as you scale your analytical workloads from gigabytes to terabytes to petabytes and even to exabytes. So what is a potential solution here? Well, this is where data warehousing come into play. So what is the best data warehousing solution to tackle uh, such a challenge and such an opportunity? Well, we've categorized it into six different sections. The first one is that it has to be able to ingest data in anywhere, in all shapes, anytime, sorry, in anywhere, anytime, in all shapes and sizes. The second is that it should have the simplicity, uh, the complexity abstracted away from you. So it should be easy to use. That's the complexity part. And then the third one is, is that it should scale seamlessly to your needs. So what this means is that as your traffic increases, your resources should scale out. And as your traffic decreases for fluctuates throughout the day, it should also uh, decrease respectively or scale in. And this leads to the next point, which is pay for only what you use. So you shouldn't have to be able to pay for unnecessary resources or idle resources when you're not using them. And next is that it should be top price performing. What this means is that it should be competitive in terms of pricing across all the other alternative options. And last but not least, it should provide real-time predictive analytics at a petabyte scale. And so from all of these six different categories, that's what makes a robust data warehousing solution. It's really to improve your operational efficiency, make well-informed decisions, as well as accelerate your innovation. And Amazon Redshift exceeds all of those criteria, and it brings additional advantages too. It is the most widely used cloud data warehouse and helps tens and thousands of customers across their, uh, to provide analytical business insights at scale. So, uh, and it brings additional advantages. And what are those? Well, first is that it's easy analytics for everyone. So what this means is that it focus, you, you can focus on getting insights in seconds without having to manage the uh, underlying infrastructure. The second is that you should analyze all, it should, you should be able to analyze all your data. So in the traditional manner, you have your uh, Hadoop silo, you have your data warehousing silo, you have your operational silo. So it's really about freeing that data of movement where different departments with the right authorization and authentication, of course, to really access the, the, the data freely. Next, it should, it should be performance at scale. What this means is that um, and now I should give you a really good example in regards to performance. So we've, uh, not too long ago, we released uh, a new node type called the RA3 nodes for Amazon Redshift. What this means is that you can scale your storage and compute independently and only incur the cost of either compute or storage. And last but not least, it should be designed to be secure and compliant. What this means is that it has the built-in security network isolation, encryption, authentication, and authorization. And I'll talk a little bit more of that in an upcoming slide. So 
at AWS, we continue to listen to our customers and as we change and grow. I'm not gonna go through every single one of these bullet points as, as you uh, see here, but what I want to really for you to understand is that at AWS, we listen to our customers' feedback. And so, starting off, back in 2012, we've launched Amazon Redshift. And this was the first cloud data warehousing solution um, across the industry. And this was when big data was still forming as a concept. And then, and then, so throughout that time, what we've discovered is that customers not only wanted to implement the data lake architecture, but they also wanted to extend their data warehousing solutions across their data lake. And this led to the introduction of Amazon Redshift Spectrum. And then afterwards, uh, we had customers asking us, can we scale the storage and compute independently? And that's when uh, this led to the release of Amazon, um, of the Amazon Redshift RA3 nodes. And then we had customers asking us, okay, what if we wanted to run machine learning models? What if we, because we want to add additional AI workloads. And this led to the release of Amazon Redshift ML, which I will talk about more in an uh, upcoming slide. So, before I jump uh, forward, I just want to uh, re-emphasize. At AWS, we listen to 90% 90 per, uh, 90 of our features, of our service releases, are from customer feedback. The, ten, the other 10% is from the strategic interpretation of your feedback. So now let's talk a little bit more about how Redshift and the modern data architecture uh, really uh, integrates well with one another. So customers have been increasingly moving to the modern data lake architecture or the modern data architecture. So before we, uh, before we jump into how Redshift uh, is, uh, takes part in that, um, let's talk a little bit about the modern data architecture. So the idea of this concept is that it's to use a broad and deep collection of purpose-built services to provide your analytical or to scale up your analytical workloads. So this can involve dashboarding, log analytics, um, data processing, and also last but not least, data warehousing. It's about connecting uh, your data stores, your processes, and your business intelligence uh, systems as, as a whole. And it all starts with Amazon S3. Customers have been using Amazon S3 for their data lakes longer than any other cloud provider. Now, if you want to query or uh, provide ad hoc analysis, you, have, you can use our Amazon uh, Athena tool. It's a serverless SQL tool. Highly scalable and very robust. Now, for data governance, as well as ETL transformations, we have the AWS Lake Formation and AWS Glue. Now, let's uh, focus a little bit more about, uh, uh, down there about Amazon Redshift. So, the idea of a data lake, the concept, is a centralized repository, figuratively speaking. It's a centralized repository for all your open data formats, including structured, non-structured, semi-structured, et cetera. And so, what's really good is that you can include your data lake, you can include Redshift as part of your data lake. And I'll show you just how, uh, how easy it is in this upcoming slide right here. So diving deeper into some of the functionalities that Amazon Redshift provides, um, it, it really enables you to break down that data silo. So starting from the top, we have BI and, uh, and, and the analytics apps. So what this means is that you can connect your business intelligence tools to Amazon Redshift using standard SQL. Now, this is, for example, Tableau, Looker, um, Periscope, QuickSight, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you want to run machine learning workloads, you can use Amazon Redshift ML. Now, to extend your data lake or your Amazon Redshift uh, clusters data into your data lake, you can use Amazon Redshift Spectrum. Now, what's really interesting here is that you can um, join the data between your the data in your local cluster as well as your Amazon S3 storage, and, uh, and, then you can, and then you can either export those query results into Amazon Redshift or back into S3 for other consumers to read. 
Now, let's say if you have third-party data or third-party vendors, you can uh, leverage Amazon Redshift's data sharing feature. And now let's say you have operational data or OLTP transactional databases, et cetera. With Amazon Redshift, you can use the federated query features to, uh, in a sense, um, qu query the, the data um, in place on the, uh, that's living on the transactional data and then join it with the local data on your Redshift cluster. So now let's take a uh, look at price performance uh, when it comes to Redshift. So the main point I want to get across is that Amazon Redshift is very, very fast. It has a self-tuning and self-learning mechanism that allows you to get the best performance for your workloads without having the undifferentiated heavy list lifting of managing your infrastructure. Um, you don't have to define sorting keys. Um, uh, di distribution styles, and it also provides new capabilities such as auto refresh and auto query rewrites. So our principle of listening to the ever-changing landscape has helped thousands of customers derive a lot of business uh, meaningful uh, value out of their data. We're continuously learning from our customers across different use cases and across different industries. So what I also want to add here is that, uh, as you can see, we have a number of very prominent uh, leaders in, in each industry using uh, our services. And so from their feedback, we iterated across them and we're bringing those benefits to you. Now let's take a look at data privacy and security. So security at AWS is our top priority. When it comes to Amazon Redshift, we have the modern uh, standard of uh, authentication, access control, auditing, encryption, and compliance. So starting off with authentication, we have IAM integration. Now, if you have uh, your, your identity providers, such as Azure AD, Okta, Ping Federate, et cetera, you are able to integrate it with Amazon Redshift. And then you are also able to, uh, you are also able to enable a multi-factor authentication. For access control, we offer column level privileges uh, for Amazon Redshift as well as the data lake. And then we also offer role-based access. For auditing purposes, we have, uh, it's integrated with AWS CloudTrail. So uh, for those of you who may not know what AWS CloudTrail is, uh, so if you ever go into the AWS console and if you ever uh, make any API calls, even just clicking on a, on a button within your AWS account, that gets logged with AWS CloudTrail. So this really helps with regulation, with uh, achieving compliance. Oh, uh, I, I can take questions after if that's okay. Awesome. Um, and then when it comes to encryption, we have AWS KMS integration. So this is our key management uh, service. Now, you are able to encrypt uh, data in transit and as well as at rest. For tokenization or even if you want to obfuscate a part of your data, you can use AWS Lambda UTFs that's tightly integrated with your Redshift cluster. Now, to, in terms of compliance, Amazon Redshift is certified and compliant under Canadian Center for C Cybersecurity. So we have achieved the compliance under the CCCS. We are also compliant under PCI, SOC, FedRAMP, HIPAA, and many others as well. So now let's take a look at how you can analyze your data. So how you can break down those data silos across databases, data lakes, and also your data warehouse. The first in mind is that it should provide easy analytics at a faster time to value. So what does this mean? Amazon Redshift is fully managed, which means that it by, you can bypass the administrative task by taking advantage of the automated provisioning, patching, and monitoring. So what does this entail? It means that you take less time managing the infrastructure, which means you have more time providing more value for your, uh, for, for your assignments, for your projects, and for your businesses. And also, uh, with Amazon Redshift, uh, you can easily explore, analyze, and collaborate um, with uh, BI tool integrations, but also with Amazon Redshift Editor Query version two. This was recently released. So with this powerful editor, you're able to author queries, 
uh, store, uh, store in stored procedures, as well as uh, create user-defined functions. Now, to simplify data access, we have what's called Amazon Redshift Data API. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in this, uh, later in this presentation. But essentially, what you can do is uh, integrate it with your web applications, your service-based applications, and you don't need to configure drivers or manage database connections. Oh, and I forgot one more. Uh, integrate spatial uh, data using your analytical query. So you are able to, um, uh, you are able to perform spatial SQL functions, and you are able to construct those geometric shapes, import and export, and access those spatial data. Now, going back uh, what I previously, me previously mentioned, Amazon Redshift Federated Queries. So we had customers asking us, what if we wanted to do join data between our operational databases as well as our Amazon Redshift, uh, as well as our data warehousing uh, Redshift cluster? Well, with Amazon Redshift, you can do just that. So when you query uh, data from Amazon Redshift, uh, when you query data from your, uh, uh, when you execute a query on Amazon Redshift to query data from your operational data set, um, you're not loading all of that data. You're not doing a full copy of that transactional data onto the cluster. That data is queried in place and the results are sent back. And, and then um, in terms of compatibility, we have Amazon RDS and Amazon Aurora. So Amazon Redshift Federated Queries is compatible with both, um, with both uh, SQL and MySQL for Amazon RDS and also Amazon Aurora. And so this keeps your uh, ETL lean, and also this uh, doesn't require you to perform any ETL uh, or, or uh, ETL processing. Now we had customers asking us, okay, what if we wanted to join and uh, run uh, analytical queries on exabytes of data? So this is where the spectrum comes into play. It enables the da modern data architecture to query exabytes of data on your S3 data, data lake. It keeps your data lean, and something else I didn't mention in the, in the beginning, that data is queried in place. So you're not, you're not exporting an exabyte of data to your Amazon Redshift cluster and then, uh, and then uh, exporting it out again. Um, you're essentially querying the data in place, which keeps uh, your data warehouse very lean. Now, Amazon Redshift Spectrum is powered by a separate fleet of Spectrum nodes. So, um, so what, what this means is that it has no impact on your Redshift cluster when you query data on S3. Now, when it comes to uh, scalability and parallelism, so before I dive into uh, uh, the, uh, the, the number of spectrum nodes in comparison to uh, how much uh, like your Redshift cluster requires, so within Amazon Redshift cluster, there's called what's called nodes. It's a made up of a cluster of nodes. Each node uh, can be, consists of one or more node slice. And so you have a soft limit of up to uh, 10 spectrum nodes uh, per node slice, which means that if you have 10, a cluster of 10 node slices, you have a soft limit of up to 100, um, you have a, a 100 spectrum nodes. This really enables that massive parallelism. And in terms of caching, uh, caching, you're able to uh, create materialized views. So what this means is, is that uh, you can query the data, create a materialized views, and then that would reduce the read performance, uh, improve the read performance, uh, improve the read performance impact on your uh, Redshift cluster. Now, starting with Redshift Data API. So we had customers asking us, okay, what if we wanted to integrate Redshift with our web-based application for analytical reporting? Do I have to persist the ODBC or the JDBC connection pool? The answer is no. With Amazon Redshift Data API, you don't have to configure those connections anymore. You don't have to configure drivers, you don't have to configure connection pools. And how you do this is that Redshift Data API, you can think of it just as a HTTP uh, REST endpoint with the right authorization and authentication, of course. 
So with this, it's also integrated with uh, our AWS SDKs that's available in Python, Go, Java, Node.js, C++, and other languages. So all you have to do is, you see on the screen, uh, that that's essentially a command on the AWS CLI, AWS Redshift-Data execute statement, and then essentially it will run the SQL statement. And you can integrate that with your web-based applications. It uh, uses, and then in terms of database credentials, you can use AWS Secrets Manager. So you simply import uh, or you add your uh, database credentials to AWS Secrets Manager and you give Redshift access to that secret. And so therefore you're not flinging around the, uh, the, the database credentials uh, across your code repositories. Now, we also had customers asking us, okay, we have the finance department, we have the uh, marketing department, we have um, the data science department. Do we have to uh, reproduce this, this data across different clusters? The answer is no. You can use Amazon Redshift data sharing. And what this means is that you are able to share your data across the different clusters. And, and in a sense, when you query the data from one cluster to the other, you're minimizing the, the, the data movement in between. So you're not copying the full data into the original uh, cluster that has been queried. You're simply moving the data, the query results from that cluster to the original cluster. You can do this cross account and as well as cross region. Now, we then introduced an additional functionality. We've recently released what's called AWS Data, uh, data Exchange with, uh, um, sorry, AWS Data Exchange with Amazon Redshift, with the, the data sharing feature. What this means is that you can actually package your data up. And then what you can do is that you can have subscribers subscribe to it. Now, AWS Data Exchange, tightly integrated with Amazon Redshift, uh, it would uh, deal with the manual uh, management overhead, the manual management overhead for you. So whenever you want a subscription to end, what you can do is you can simply uh, uh, set, set the rules, and AWS uh, Data Exchange will automatically give de uh, deny read access to your data. And this happens live as well. When you update your data uh, to you, your Redshift cluster, what you can do is um, uh, the updates are live, so your subscribers can subscribe to it immediately. And then next, we had customers asking us, okay, we want to run Amazon, uh, we want to run machine learning models. How can we do this? Are we able to do this in the actual local cluster itself? The answer is yes. You can use Amazon Redshift ML. And the use cases for this are examples such as identify anomalies, uh, fraud prevention, and as well as reduce customer churn. So what you can do is that you can deploy, train, um, create, and as well as run inferences using in your local cluster using standard SQL. And, and so how you, uh, one example of this is that what you can see from the bottom right-hand screen is that uh, you simply create the model, and then you identify the name as customer churn, select your features for your models, and then, uh, and then set, set the function as predict customer churn. So once your model is ready, what you can do is that you can simply just call that function and it will run the predictions for you. So that's everything that I have. I'll now pass it over to Ahmed, who will talk about more about the Redshift scalability aspects. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. Hi, everybody. So before continuing, let's go back to our memory lane and see when Redshift started and how far it is. It is actually pretty young. If you look at Amazon itself, Amazon started in 94. Amazon Web Services started at 2006. Amazon Redshift started at 2012. So it's actually less than 10 years old. And when it actually became generally available in 2013, five years later, by 2018, Forrester released a report saying that Amazon Redshift is the data warehousing with the highest number of deployment, de deployments in cloud. So we were already in a good place by 2018. The thing is, we are not really motivated by analytic reports. We are more motivated by our customers, our customer needs. 
what exactly they want. And our customers told us that they have an issue. And the issue is that whenever they have a spike in their workload because of any reason, like you can have months end reporting, you can have a special event like back, back to school event or Christmas event or such event. In those events, the, their current provisioned clusters cannot keep up with, with the demand. And they asked us for a way to solve this because they don't want to over provision and it's also hard to plan for those events. Sometimes they happen suddenly. And Amazon Web Services answer to this challenge came in 2019 by introducing concurrency scaling. Concurrency scaling is simply the ability of Amazon Redshift to offer you transient clusters to serve your query load. Once we detected that, you have a query spike. So what Amazon Redshift does, it monitor your query load, and when it sees that, oh, he's getting more queries than his current cluster can serve, then it actually spin another cluster to serve those queries. And if there is more need, it spin another cluster. And so on until the demand is met, and then it basically deprovision back all those and go back to the normal capacity. So it automatically scale up and down for you based on your need. We give our customers the ability to decide if they would like to use this feature or not. We give our customers the ability to decide if they would like to use it for all of their workload or they want to use it for a specific workload. Customers might have different workload. He has his own ingestion workload. He has his own reporting workload. And he'd like to set this for reporting only. He doesn't want to set it up for ad hoc guys, for example. And the other thing as well is this, we offer free one hour of usage every day for our customers. And this is actually accumulated per the billing uh, cycle, which is usually monthly. This means that we offer you 30 hours of free usage of concurrency scaling in every month. And we offer the customer the ability to decide the usage limits themselves. So the customer can say, define a usage limit rule saying, you know what, I'd like to set up the usage limit to 30 hours per month. After 30 hours per month, I don't want to use concurrency scaling anymore. And this means that he will be using concurrency scaling without actually paying for it. 97% of our customers do that actually. 97% of AWS customers using concurrency scaling in Amazon Redshift without paying for it. Another request came from our customers, and they basically wanted the ability to scale the storage and compute independently from each other. What happened was our legacy family of nodes, we call them dense compute nodes, DC, and dense storage node, DS. Those nodes, one of them were focused on having higher compute power, while the other one was focused on having more storage. The problem was, any time you need to add a storage, you have to add more nodes, which also come with an extra compute. And the vice versa. Any time you need more compute, you get a new nodes, which also have a storage. And customers didn't like this, because they might need to have more storage, but they don't want to pay for extra compute, and vice versa. So Amazon Web Service uh, solution to this came in 2019. And in 2019, we introduced RS3 node. RS3 node, Redshift Analytic Generation 3, has this ability to separate the storage from the compute. And when we offered this, we offered it in three different denominations, small, medium, and large. We call small XL plus, medium is called RS3 for XL, large is called RS3 16 XL. Every one of them giving you more capacity than the previous one. Also, we offered our customers the ability to have a cluster composed of one node only, one node RA3 XL+, plus, the smallest one. And this helps our customers a lot when they want to break their workload into different clusters, or if they'd like to create a quick cluster for development or any other purpose. And finally, we made a special program to help our customers migrate the reserved instance of their legacy nodes to RA3. Now, if, if you go back again to the roots, 
it's like anybody who got involved in data warehousing, it's, it's, it's a very, very sophisticated practice. It's, it involves a lot of ETL, it involves a lot of data moving here and there and there, a lot of breaking points. And sometimes after many years asking yourself why, why I'm doing this. And the reason we are doing this is, is, is very simple. It's basically to be able to fulfill customer demand. Customers want to see the data in certain ways and they want this to be in a performant way and a cost effective way. So this is what drives all of this. And because of this, in AWS, we have invested in those tracks. Autonomics. Basically, we spend so much time and energy to make sure that the customers are getting all the maintenance job automated for them and in a cost effective way. Looking at this, for example, we have ATO, which is automatic table optimization. In order, in order to get a best performance out of a table, you have to define a certain characteristics to make this table fast. We call those distribution key, we call those sorting key, we call those encoding compression. All those things take some time and energy from the customer to do. We give the option to manually define them, but we also offer our customers the ability to automate this. And by automating this, this is decided by Redshift. Redshift will monitor your query pattern, and from the queries running, it will decide that, you know what, this table better be distributed this way, or this table better be sorted this way, or this is the best compression for this data. And by doing this, the customer realizes the performance without actually spending time studying the nature of the data. The thing is, this requires some training because this is machine learning. And customers were not happy with the fact that it takes some time for training, so we also offer smart default. Using the original data, we can decide, you know what, if he defines this as a primary key in his um, OLTB system, maybe it makes sense to make it the distribution key. So we try to use some intelligence to decide what is the best default for those tables as well. There are maintenance jobs that are required, like you need to collect the statistics so the optimizer can tell what is the best plan. You need to actually do a defragmentation because when you are deleting data, this causes fragmentation. We have to defragment the tables. You need to do resorting. If you have a sorting key on a table and you are not inserting the data in this sorting order, then you really have to sort the data. All those are maintenance jobs. Again, we give our customers the ability to manually do this However, we also give them the option of having this automated. So we do have an automatic, automatic analyze, automatic vacuum, which will do those jobs uh, uh, automatically in the background. Materialized views. And we're going to talk about materialized views in details. But one very important thing about materialized views is how we are going to refresh the materialized views. And again, we have an option to automatically refresh your materialized view for you. What happens is this redshift will monitor the base tables. Once the base tables have changed, it will automatically refresh the materials view for you. Workload management. You have in your cluster or your data warehouse database, you have different workload. And those different workload are competing with each other. We give you the ability to define the workload and to give different priority for different users under different queues. And this way, we give you a proactive way of dealing with the workload, which we call it auto workload management. Amazon Redshift Advisor is a tool we provide our customers with, which will contain a lot of advices for you in order to get the best out of your cluster. Materialized views. Materialized views is simply a way to resist the data of a certain select statement. And the advantage of this, it gives you a huge performance benefit. Usually, for dashboarding or reporting, you usually run the same query once, twice, and three times, sometimes more. And it might make sense to resist the results because next time you are going to run that query, and instead of running the whole query and the joins, you are just reading directly from the results. So this is the value of materialized view. It gives you up to 10 times sometimes performance benefit. At AWS, with Redshift, we provide you a materialized view, and we also give you a couple of things with the materialized view. We try to do the materialized view refresh as an incremental refresh, which will give you a huge benefit performance-wise. And even if we can do an incremental refresh, we'll tell you that this has to be a full refresh, 
and the reason in the dictionary tables you can see why it cannot be a full refresh, like if you are doing an outer join or something like this. Also, what we do is we give you the option when you create the materialized view to decide, do you want this materialized view to be manually refreshed by you? A lot of customers like that. They like to make the materialized view refresh part of their ETL process. So every day when they finish the ETL, they just go and issue materialized view refresh. On the other hand, some other customers like to have this automated for them. So when they create the materialized view, they can say that I'd like it to be auto-refresh. And in this case, Redshift will auto-refresh the materialized view once it sees the base tables have changed. Another very important feature that we offer in the materialized view is the auto query rewrite. Auto query rewrite is an amazing feature. What happened is many of our customers go and create a certain materialized view, but the thing is it's not just about the materialized view. Now you have to go and change all of your reports and point them to the materialized views instead of just using the base tables. And this sometimes is actually much more effort than the creation of the materialized view itself. So Redshift offer you this ability is this. Redshift will actually monitor your queries. And if it sees that this query will benefit of using a materialized view, although it's already written against the base tables, it will actually rewrite the query for you and point it to the materialized view instead of the base tables. So you will get the benefit of using the materialized view without changing the queries. Now, materialized view also support local data and also support uh, ex external data, like data in S3 or data using federated queries in other OLTV databases. Now, because we were very excited about this, we actually decided to even take one step further. And this step is creating automated materialized views. And by this, Redshift will actually monitor your workload, look at your query pattern, and if it sees that there is a certain query that keep repeating, and it makes sense to have a materialized view for that, it will actually automatically create the materialized view for you without you even doing it yourself. And then, anytime this query coming, it will rewrite the query to use the materialized view. And it will keep monitoring, and if it finds that the query pattern change and this materialized view is not needed anymore, it will drop the materialized view for you. So this is automated materialized view. It just became GA this year. Now, Amazon Redshift innovate to meet your needs. We have seen that there are three different categories that we need to invest for our customers to make the benefit. And this is basically integration. So Lake House, AWS integration. The other one is performance and cost. And the third one is being cost effective. And in those, we have invented a lot of features and a lot of functions in Redshift to help the customers get the best. An example of this is the machine learning, data sharing. An example of this in, in, in the performance one is RS3, Aqua. And an example of this of the cost and grid value is automatic word load management, uh, data ABI, pause and resume. We offer our customers who are using um, a provision cluster, the ability to pause the cluster and resume the cluster again. Whenever you pause the cluster, you don't pay for it. Once you resume the cluster, then you pay for it. Now, amazing, this pause and resume thing is great. However, customers were not really satisfied with this. This is not like, if, if you have ever administrated an environment, it, 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 pre it presents a huge challenge to pause a cluster and then somebody is coming and trying to run a query and the cluster is paused. So what can we do? And our customers asked us that we really wanted a better management for this. And we have introduced Amazon Redshift Serverless. Amazon Redshift Serverless was actually introduced last year in reInvent in November 2021 and it became GA this year. It's not really GA yet in Canada, but it's going to be GA in Canada sometime at the end of this month. So what is serverless exactly? What is Amazon Redshift serverless? Amazon Redshift serverless work in four tenets. The first tenet is simplified user experience. We wanted to make the customer experience much easier, and we are going to demonstrate later on or show this later on. 
But basically, it's much easier to provision than the actual provision cluster. You don't have to answer many questions. It's, it's much simpler to do. Intelligence and dynamic compute. This part about how many nodes you need and the concurrent scaling bar, this is all handled automatically. The Redshift serverless will monitor your workload and figure out if it needs to scale up or not. All Amazon Redshift functionality and performance. Whatever functionality and performance you are currently enjoying in your provision cluster is going to be the same that you will be enjoying there. So when you are migrating, you don't have to change anything. And finally, it's pay for use. And this is really the biggest plus, is that you will only pay for queries you are running. So if you are running queries for five minutes, you will only pay for five minutes. You don't have to pay for the cluster time for 24 hours. So that's basically Amazon Redshift serverless. In the next slides, I'm going to show you um, certain use cases where Amazon Redshift serverless makes a difference and how it can be used. So first case here is self-serve analytics use case. And here we have like a well-established depart department who already established their architecture. It's working fine and they have no problem. They are working at capacity. They didn't over-provision or under-provision. Everything is working fine. The architecture is very simple. They have data coming from the source system, going, getting pushed into S3, and from there getting transformed using AWS Glue, pushed into Amazon Redshift provision cluster. And from there, you have the report guys using Tableau, coming using GDBC, ODBC connectivity, and reading data. Everybody is happy. Everybody is OK. Suddenly, we have a new data science team. And those guys are getting a task that they need to build certain predictive modeling to serve uh, the executives. They came and said that we need to get access to this provision cluster. And the provision cluster administrator said, oh, hold a minute. So tell me, how, many, how much compute do you need? How much storage do you need? And this is really a very silly question because nobody really knows. So the first thing they said, we don't know. We know that we need access to all the data. We know that we need to do, run a lot of queries and a lot of modeling and stuff like that. But we can't really tell you how much. Second thing is, this cluster is already at capacity. So I can't really give you more compute resources unless you tell me how much, and then we can talk later. So again, they don't have an answer for this. And the fourth thing is, this cluster is owned by a certain department, and this department is fi financially liable for this. So they are paying for the cost of the compute and storage. They don't want to be paying for another team. So all those challenges here in, in provision is going to be solved if we implement the following solution. Simply create a serverless instance and have a connection between them using data sharing. And by doing this, you actually solve all the problems. Number one is, they don't really have to figure out how much compute and storage they need. They can start by simply setting a certain base RPU, and then based on their usage, they are going to be charged. And if their usage is much, it's going to scale up for them automatically. So it's much easier. And data sharing doesn't impact the performance of the producer cluster. So the producer cluster is almost untouched. There is no impact on it. So they can keep running as well. And the final thing is, this serverless instance is going to be owned by the new data science team. So they are liable for their cost and for usage only. And the best thing is this environment can be done in 30 minutes. You can create another instance of serverless and create data sharing within 30 minutes. So this shows us an ease of use of the uh, serverless. The second case here is basically workload separation use case. In this case here, we have a department, and this department is having the following uh, architecture. They are doing streaming, so it's like 24 hours of streaming. Data is coming from different sources, going to Amazon Kinesis data stream, to Amazon Kinesis Firehose, pushed into Amazon Redshift provisioned, and then the report guys are accessing the data using GDBC, ODBC. We have like 12 nodes, RS3, 4, XL, for this cluster. This is all OK. The thing is, almost four of those nodes are used to serve the ingestion. 
the extra eight nodes are mainly for reports. And the report guys, they keep ha having add, like they keep having spikes. And this causes concurrency scaling for the whole cluster. And also it's very hard to control the cost of it. So the question is, what can we do to make this better? And the solution is to break this environment into two clusters, one provision cluster and one serverless instance. And let's move the report guys to the serverless instance. What did this give us? Number one is we kept the streaming on the provision cluster, so it's working fine. And then we move the report guys to um, Amazon Redshift serverless. And this gives us two advantages. Number one is we can give them actually more resources. So they are getting 128 RPU, which is way more than the eight uh, XL, four XL large they were getting before. So this will give them better performance. But it will also give them the ability to scale up if needed without the need to bother anybody. And it will also cost-wise will be better because they are going to only pay for what they use. And the third scenario here is that we have a producer cluster with daily batch ingestion. Those guys are a little bit ahead of the different department. So what they have is they have already a provision cluster and they have a serverless instance. And the provision cluster is only used for ingestion. The problem is the data ingestion takes around three hours, but they need to keep the cluster up for eight hours. Why? Because data doesn't come at the same time. Yes, it takes three hours, but the data come from different sources. This comes at like 8 a.m., this one comes at like noon, and so they come at different time, and the administrator is having problems controlling this cluster. So what they did is they went to serverless. And when they converted this provision cluster to serverless cluster, they did a couple of things. Number one is that they simplified the administration. They don't have to schedule auto pause and resume. It's going to be handled totally by serverless. Whenever the source data is coming, then it will start up, process the data, and then shut down again. And the other thing also, it gives them a better cost because instead of keeping a provision cluster for eight hours, you don't have to do this with serverless. Within three hours, you can actually do the processing and you will only pay for three hours. Those are three different cases. So next steps, if you're already using Redshift, I encourage you to ask your account team to get acquainted with the newest features so you can actually make use of them. If you are not using Redshift, I encourage you to talk to your account team for a 10 minute demonstration of Redshift. And you can also reach us, uh, reach, reach out to us for, for any further questions. Uh, those QR codes here is for certification. So we encourage you to look at our certification programs. We have uh, 13 different certification for different tracks. We offer more than 500 courses uh, digitally free. And you also offer those in 16 different languages. Please scan those QR codes uh, for, for more information. Now, today we have introduced you how to use Amazon Redshift within AWS environment to solve data warehousing needs. And I hope that was a great event. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.